Hello and welcome to Blender 101. I, I gotta write it out because it's so much fun at this point. And this will be session six because we know our Roman numeral numerals. That's right. And today we're gonna be looking at several things uh, on the docket for starters. We're gonna be taking a look at, well, actually, you know, before we even do lighting, well, let me not get too far ahead of myself. We're gonna take a really quick look at setting up the backdrop. And I know some of you have already done this because it really is very easy. It may be the easiest thing we do today, so you'll probably be really you know, laid back and chilling uh, when we get there. And then we're going to take a look at lighting. We're actually going to talk very briefly about the various light types available inside a blender. And I figured this is also going to be pretty easy, but some of you out there, you know, if you're totally new to this, your smile may start to fade just a little bit. I mean, you're, you'll still be happy to be here, you know. Then we're going to take a look at rendering. And at this point, you know, I think most of you will still be, you know, you're pretty good, but maybe a little, you know, like, hmm. And then we're going to take a look at compositing. And by the time we get here, you guys, well, I, I shouldn't even make a frowny face, because let's be honest, uh, once we get here, you guys will be asleep. So, uh, that's what we have on the docket for today. Now, um, before we actually get rolling, I did have a couple of announcements I wanted to kind of throw out there. Uh, for uh, those of you who do pay attention to the newsletters that we keep throwing into your email boxes, you already know that our UDK class is uh, up for registration right now for you, for you member sponsors out there. We've got a, a six-week class put together. I'm really excited about it a uh, special topics course that is going to be going over six individual in-depth topics that you absolutely need to know if you want to have any skill whatsoever in using UDK. It's a, a fantastic course that will be starting in, what is it, a little over a week, I think? Yeah, just like, a, like right over a week. I think it's Monday after next that class will actually be started. Uh, be sure to get registered soon. There are going to be two sessions of it. There is a Monday evening session and then a Thursday afternoon session. Of course, all times are in uh, CDT Central Time to me, which is GMT minus 5, but all of that is over in the thread. Just keep an eye out over on the member sponsor forums, and everything you need to know should be listed in there. Uh, UDK is the Unreal Development Kit, for those of you who are unfamiliar with that. It uh, allows you to create your own games with Unreal Engine 3. That's right, the same game engine that powers things like Gears of War and all kinds of other fun stuff. So, um, yeah... Let's see here. Uh, um, somebody says sources. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, uh, let's see. Uh, today, as I mentioned, we've got all of this stuff we're going to handle. Are there any questions b about anything that's happened up to this point before we actually begin? Uh, any questions that I can tackle? If you've got a question, please throw it over into the webinar system because it's hard for me to keep up with questions that scroll by and chat all the time. I uh, just kind of want to know, how are people doing now that we're kind of uh, wrapping things up with this class? Uh, this week, this assignment you guys had was pretty easy. Um, in fact, everything that, uh, that you really needed to do, we pretty much did on camera. So as long as you watched the video, uh, which was a lot shorter than some of the videos we've had for sure, uh, then you were essentially good to go. And I've already got a lot of assignments. Uh, somebody said, what do you mean when you say reset all normals? How do you do that? Uh, generally, that means make sure all of your normals are outward facing. So if you have a model, like, you know, I don't know why. I mean, here, here's a model of a really terrible egg-shaped like sphere thing. Uh, you want to make sure that all of your normals are pointed out. You don't want them to be actually pointed into the surface. That is bad. Now, you can press the N key on your keyboard, uh, and that will open up the little panel over on the side. And when you're in edit mode, you'll see um, display, and then you'll see a little checkbox for face normals. And if you check that, then you'll be able to visualize these things. You can reset your normals on an object uh, by selecting all your faces and hitting uh, control N. And that will solve that problem. It, uh, it'll just recalculate everything. If you need to, though, be sure to just tap your space bar and you know, type in normals, and you'll see all those commands pop up. And you can choose which one you need, because there, there are several there that can really help you out. And let's see, uh, any quick way to set up camera? Uh, I manually move around. Yeah, there is. Um, there's a, a great way. In fact, we're going to be kind of playing with that today. So let's not get too far ahead of ourselves, because that's something that we'll be looking at uh, a bit later today. 
Do you mean uh, – now let me just uh, – that's from John uh, Cornoyer. Uh, I probably just butchered your last name, and I apologize if I did. Uh, do you mean like the ability to use your standard view as if it was a camera? Is that kind of what you're shooting for? Uh, give me like a yes or no, and then I'll know whether or not I should really answer the question right this second. Uh, or, you know, you can also just sit there. That's always an option. You could not answer me. I believe you mentioned Maya. I'm not sure what you mean at all. Is that a yes or a no? Yeah, I was kind of hoping for a yes and a, or maybe a no, uh, basically a positive or a negative. I feel like Portal 2. Like, you know, if you say hello or whatever and you hit the space bar and jump. So it's like, no, what you're doing is jumping. You know, that's... <laughs> 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 all right, well... So, yeah, if, without clarity, it's hard for me to answer your questions. Um, let's see, with proportional editing, I will turn off proportional editing. But if I select faces, it appears to be a proportional edit. Is there another way to turn off proportional editing other than the button at the bottom of the menu bar? Yes, press the O key, because O sounds a lot like proportional, I guess. I don't know, it's, that's just where the hotkey is. So, um, yeah. But make sure you actually have turned it off and not just... Yeah. Moved it from connected to on or vice versa. Right, yeah. Keep an eye on that little button down there so you can see what the setting is. But the hotkey, if you don't want to move your mouse all the way down there and click stuff, that's uh, that's O. Uh, let's see. Dun, 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 dun. Is there a way to move all of your keyframes after a given point uh, for all of your different objects with their animation? Yeah, you should be able to. Um, I mean, depending on exactly how you mean that. So let me grab... Uh, let's just grab a file with some stuff in it. Dum, 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 dum. And if I grab, I don't know, some objects that are animated, and I've already got a graph editor in this scene. By the way, that's where you're going to do all this kind of stuff is in the graph editor. Uh, let's see, and let's, this, this guy also animated. Basically, you just need to get all the animation curves you want to edit into the graph editor at the same time. Be really, really careful about that, though, um, because, like, I use a lot of visibility on my curves because sometimes I don't want to see every single curve out there, right? So I'll turn stuff off. Just be aware that you've done that. You can hit Home to, you know, make sure that everything is selected. Tap the A key to deselect, then hit B. Remember B? Use B a lot in the viewport, or at least, you know, maybe you do. That's for box selecting, but it works here in the graph editor as well. So you just hit B, drag out a selection over your keys... Now, if you need these to happen later in time, no big deal. Tap the G key. Remember G? It's like moving. Grab. Hit G. And you can move these. But if you only want to move them in time, that means you're only moving them horizontally. So click the middle mouse and drag to the right. And now you're just taking all those keys and sliding them so they happen later in time. So you can see down there in the timeline, all those keys trucking along further on down the line. The only catch is that you've got to select everything that you need to adjust. So, uh, you know, if you want, it's not just going to automatically grab every single keyframe out there. It's just the selected objects. That's the big thing you need to keep in mind. So make sure you carefully grab the selected objects. And let's see. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. I hope that answers your question, Wolf Knightley. And uh, if you were meaning earlier, uh, John, if you were asking... Uh, if there was a way to move the camera around with the view, there is indeed. And matter of fact, we're going to make use of that later today. Not necessarily to move the camera. I wanted you guys to have the camera set up way early on. So that should already be done at this point. And, um, yeah, okay. Yeah, I see what you're saying. You're making a reference to Maya, which, uh, yeah, Maya allows you to just render out of your current view, which it's sloppy. You generally shouldn't ever do it. Uh, but in Blender, you can set up similar behavior, but you've got to basically tell Blender that that's what you want to do. In fact, you're, you're already looking at the setting. You're staring at it. It's right in the middle of your screen, or my screen. If you're looking at my screen, you see it. It's, it's right here. Lock camera to view. That's your guy. And we're going to take a look at that a little bit later today. Now, um, in other news, there is a thread over on 3D Buzz, um, over in the Member Sponsor Lounge, Blender 101, Week 6, Outline, and of course now the password, which you guys don't need, but it's there anyway. And uh, there are the outline slash notes for today's class. Speaking of which, and um, I'm just going to mention this early on, I'll probably repeat myself several times 
uh, as we go along. But I am rather sniffly today, and uh, I do ask that you guys bear with me a little bit on that because um, yeah, my allergies are just killing me right now. And let's see, um, I've already got these printed out. Oh my goodness, I was like, you know, I'm going to have to tell you guys to hang on a second while I print them. But you know what, I'm not going to have to do that, because apparently I printed them last night in my awesomeness. Which is great, I love it when stuff just works, right? Okay, so, um, with any, without any other help, let's see, help! Can't connect to BuzzNet. Isn't the link www.buzznet.3dbuzz.com? Uh, the answer is yes, except for no. Uh, you shouldn't have www in there. It should just be buzznet.3dbuzz.com. Without any sort of www. And you should be good to go. I'm thinking. Uh, let's see. Um, backdrop. It uh, helps if I put my pages in the right order, I suppose. And, uh, yeah, make sure you can get in, uh, Johan, and let me know that you got in. So that I'm not, uh, so I know that that helped you. And I'll, I guess I should look back over in BuzzNet and see that you get in. Hee <laughs> hee. Chris, that only takes me so far, because honestly, I can't keep track of everybody's usernames. It's, it's just one of those things. I see real names over in the webinar system, for the most part. And then usernames over in 3D Buzz, and sometimes it's just difficult for me to, to narrow the two down. Okay. Alright, cool. Johan's in. Oh, oh, I don't have the sky texture. No, probably none of you do. Um, let me see if I Google. can... And, well, you can just grab one off Google, but I can supply you with one. Let me see if I can get to the bottom of that real quick. Oh, man. Sniffs. Oh, I really wish I could turn off all sounds on my computer, so... Um, but I'm afraid to actually mute stuff, because, well, that'll probably just mess up the recording. Uh, let's see, uh, actually, I have it in Dropbox, believe it or not, but let me get it out of Dropbox and put it up for download so everybody can have that. So I'll go ahead and put it in a quick archive, if you guys will bear with me for just a moment. And we'll call this Sky Texture. And I'll put Blender 101 at the beginning of it so people know what that is. Do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do. All right, that's... There. Awesome. And let me jump over to FileZilla and let me upload this real quick so that you guys can have it. Because it'll be good for you guys to have that. Um, Blender. And oh man, so many windows open. There's just so many windows. And upload. Do your thing. Wah! Okay. Oh, it's not that big. Come on. I said it's going to take 20 seconds. That's okay. So. That's what she said. Uh, har, har, har. Because Gavin is so funny all the time. <laughs> all right. Uh, okay, so uh, if you guys go over to the member sponsor lounge and you go into that fantastic streaming video support files thread and then go into the download system. Underneath Blender, there's some new stuff. There's a great big download that you can go ahead and start grabbing now if you want it. You don't have to. What this is is the um, rendered frames from the animation that I put together, the little uh, demo movie for this class. It's the actual frames for that. If you just want to play with those uh, for your compositor so you don't have to do a render right now, because your render may take a long time, I went ahead and put some frames together so you can go ahead and grab those. You can also grab the sky texture we'll be using, which incidentally, yes, for those of you who are asking, is the same as the sky texture uh, that we used in the advanced digital production class. Same thing. Okay, oh, which was drawn by uh, Toby Lewin, our very own toastage from 3D Buzz. He painted that for me, which is, is just awesome. So anyway, be sure, once again, that's um, 3dbuzz.com slash vbforum, and then there's this great little thing, sv underscore ms underscore streaming underscore files dot php, and that'll take you right here, and just grab these two. Uh, the, again, the frames one, you don't have to have. If you just want some frames to play with without having to do a render, though, it'll save you some trouble. Okay, so without any further ado, let's go ahead and jump into Blender. Now, I'm not going to worry much about animation, so uh, I'll go ahead and put away my graph editor for now. 
and we'll start kind of squashing this down and make the most of my scene. The first thing I want to do is get this backdrop set up, which incidentally in this file is kind of funny because uh, it's already set up. So what I'm going to do is kind of unset it up for everyone so you can see how to do this. It's an extremely simple thing. Now, if you still see the texture uh, in my case, the reason that is is because that was assigned at the UV level. So if I go over to my uh, image editor and jump into edit mode for this guy and then currently this is what he's set to so what I need to do is just click close on that uh, so that there's no texture assigned to it and we've all seen that before we saw that back in the texturing days so hopefully if you're setting up uh, some you know backdrop of your own this is probably close to what you've got right now now setting up this backdrop is a pretty simple thing all you need to do is create a brand new material so jump over to your materials section click on the new button give this a name please always name your materials we'll call this sky or, or actually I can't type today so we'll try that again sky backdrop then here's the the trick here's the only fun thing we're gonna do is just come down here and check shadeless this means that this material is basically going to ignore lighting this is a very handy thing to use if you have things like lights or lightsabers or you know anything that glows that basically needs to completely ignore all lighting uh, you can just turn on shadeless uh, if you're a Maya person uh, this is like a surface shader and if you're not a Maya person then I'm sure it has other names and other pieces of software anyway at this point now we will just go to the texture section and click new under type just set to image or movie and then all you really need to do is navigate to that texture so I'll click open and let's see did I put it in here I probably did not so what we'll do is we'll just pretend that I did that and I'll just set it to sky texture now at this point uh, if you need to see it you know you got this thing where if you hit alt Z you know you can uh, if you don't have any lights everything is black but you can still see this uh, also, keep in mind that the orientation may cause your clouds to be upside yeah. down. I was looking at that going, is that upside down? Yeah, um, if that happens, now in this case, I actually laid out UVs for this, so that flips it. Of course, it's just a card. So if you need to, just rotate the card. Just stand it back up. It, it should be no big deal. And uh, yeah, somebody said, where is that option uh, for the material? That option is found underneath shading. So pretty straightforward set shading to shadeless that actually grays out pretty much everything your material can do so it makes your material a whole lot simpler but uh, if you don't like this whole thing where if you hit uh, alt z to see the backdrop backdrop everything goes black because uh, of course I have deleted all my lamps we're gonna be handling lighting today so it didn't make a lot of sense to have any lights in my scene uh, so I killed them all which you're welcome to do the same uh, but to solve that problem of course you've seen this before just jump into an image editor Go into edit mode with your backdrop, so just hit tab, hit A to grab all of its faces, and then just assign that to the same texture, which is probably already in your system at this point. Then, you'll be able to see it no matter what. It'll always be there, if you just feel better seeing that backdrop, which it can be handy, you know, so when you look, at, look through the camera, you can see roughly where those clouds are placed. Now, I'm going to show you guys something. If you, um, you don't have to do this, it's just one of those things that's kind of cool to do. You can take this backdrop, and real quick, even though we're not really doing anything uh, with animation today, it costs you almost no, no time at all to animate this if you want your clouds to kind of slowly pass by in the scene. Uh, of course, the quick way to do that would be select your backdrop. Make sure you take your keying sets and set that to location, because that's all you're going to be keying is location. And you can drop a keyframe here at frame zero. Scroll to the end of your animation, wherever that may be. In fact, you can... You know, overshoot it by a little bit if you want to. Just hit G and just slide this over a little bit. It doesn't really have to be a precise motion, and I wouldn't even move it very far. Just you know, a couple of pixels make all the difference in the world. So that now when you play through, and I'm getting really slow feedback. There's a really subtle shift. We have pixel by pixel, and of course you can speed yours up and slow it down. Do be aware of this. If you haven't changed the defaults for your animation curves which I haven't, by the way. Uh, if you go under the graph editor and take a look at your backdrop and home up on it, uh, let me grab these location curves specifically, or if I just show one, that'll be enough to get the point across. So I'll hide everything else, grab you. The catch is we have Bege tangency here. 
There we go. So the clouds, incidentally, are speeding up and then slowing back down, which of course is terrible, and you don't want that. So uh, if we grab all these guys and frame them all up, as long as they're all selected, we can just hit the T key and set their keyframe interpolation to linear, and that solves the problem. Now they'll move at a constant rate. And does somebody need to see camera shortcuts? Yeah, I can do that. Oh, let me come back over here. Do, 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 do. Are they not on anymore? I love it when that happens. User preferences, turn on the atoms. Look at that, screencast keys. Dink. So now you should be able to see everything I'm clicking. So once again, really the only fancy thing I click, because you guys should understand how to drop keyframes at this point, um, the only fancy things I did is make sure you set your keying, uh, keying set to location, because that's all your keyframing, so it keeps things nice and clean. Uh, move your backdrop just a you know, couple little portions of a unit just to get a little bit of scooting and then uh, jump under your animation curves select your new curves hit the T key T, and that will give you uh, the ability to choose linear and that will just make sure your clouds are all moving at a constant rate which is nice and important and will keep things looking good once you're done with that though you're probably done with animation so you can put your graph editor away and yeah we can turn off auto key at this point um, at but really, if you're not going to be nudging things around, you should be okay. Also, one of the reasons why I don't uh, generally leave on the ability to just drag anywhere in the view and automatically move stuff. I know you can do that a lot in Blender, and it drives me kind of crazy. Uh, so, let's see. Uh, are there any questions about this? Uh, I need to kind of start letting people make sure they can keep up with everything we do once again. So... Uh, somebody said, do you mind if I save this out as anything other than a TFF? I don't care what you save it out as in the end. Um, if you mean like uh, the actual backdrop, that's just how it was delivered to me. So you can save it out as anything. In the end, I don't want it back from you. Uh, you're going to be sending me a movie uh, as your final assignment. So at the end of the day, uh, I don't care what format that's in. You save it to whatever you like. Uh, so what I'd like you guys to do is everybody who is following along, if you would do the, the standard thing, uh, I don't think BuzzNet is completely infallible with ready checks yet, but let's give it a try. Um, if I reset everybody, would you please update your ready status to tell me that you are ready to move on? If you're actually following along, and if you're not following along, please uh, jump out of participate mode for me. Uh, that way I know who I need to be waiting for and who I don't. If you are following along and you're not in participate mode, please click the participate button at the top of BuzzNet. That will let me know that you're actually trying to follow along with each and every click that I'm doing. That makes things a whole lot easier on me. And it looks like most of you are pretty much done, so that's great. Okay, so the next thing I want to take a look at are the light types available inside of Blender. Now, to really kind of drive this home, uh, what I'm going to do, let's go ahead and just save this file. So, just save. We'll come back to this. I'm just going to do a brand new file. And if you'd like to do the same thing, you can. If you just kind of want to watch what I'm doing, that's totally fine, too. But we have five different light types available inside of Blender. And to show these off, I'm going to hit Shift-A and bring in a plane. And I'm going to hit S and just scale this up. And by the way, I realized that it killed the screencast keys because I did a, a new scene, which is fantacular. Let me turn those on so everybody can see all our hotkeys. Oh, uh, yeah, there's image planes in this, too. Let me go ahead and kill those out. Hee <laughs> hee. All right. So now we already have a light here. Um, we you, My scene automatically has a light. By default, Blender does that. But... I'm just going to delete that out, and we're going to create our own light. So we'll hit Shift A, jump down to Lamps, and here they are. You have Point, Sun, Spot, Hemi, or Hemisphere, and Area. The good news is, uh, for those of you who, uh, and I understand, you know, when you're, especially when you're trying to get into uh, complicated software, like 3D software for the first time, you get kind of you know, like, ooh, which one should I click? What's the right one? And maybe you panic a little. The good news is you don't have to panic. Uh, you can click on any one of these and change the light over to any of the other four types at any given time. So let's go ahead and drop in a point light. I'm going to hit G and just pull this up into the air. And that's really all we need to do. Now, let's see, I got a question coming. Can you stop a render before it's done? I couldn't figure out how to stop it. Um, spam the escape key. 
and uh, that should stop your render. At least that's what I do, and that stops my render, uh, because I've had to do that a lot, because uh, you turn on a render with like a million settings, and well, anyway. So uh, if you are looking in your view, you can switch over to uh, GLSL, and if you hit Alt-Z, you'll see the result of your lighting. Depending on your video card, I can't guarantee it's going to work great for everybody. But at least on my end, it looks pretty swanky. I'm going to move my plane up a little bit, too, and get rid of that grid, so everything's just nice and clean. Now, uh, some these lights, these uh, the actual icons for them, they come with a couple of features available to you straight out of the gate, and stuff you should know. Obviously, you have this line that points straight down. That's just there to help you visualize how high up off the ground that light is. Another little feature that uh, I'm actually not everybody knows about, it's just one of those little cool secret things. If a light is casting shadows, it gets a second little dashed halo around it. So if we come over to our light settings, by the way, if you need to change anything about your light, take a look in your properties. There's a little object data. Remember, this uh, this is a context-sensitive area. This is going to change based on what type of object you have selected. So if you jump under here, here's where all of your light settings are. Also, Yay. it's a convenient way to, uh, to restart Blender, actually. So um, we'll just go ahead and cancel that out. <laughs> yeah, that was great. And I'll just close here and... You know, I'll just keep running the beta. It'll be fine. That's just, that was a fluke. Total fluke. Hey, but look, we're back. So, uh, if you jump over to the object data for a light, you'll notice this one actually has a second dash line, and notice that it's currently set to use ray shadow. If you set it to no shadow, that disappears. It's just one of those things that you may not know right away, and is really handy to keep in mind about lights in general, because if you need to know which lights are casting shadows, you don't even have to look at the properties. Just glance at the light, and there's that extra dash line to help you out. And somebody said, is there a reason we're working with a blank plane? No, not really. Um, it was just a, a way for me to show some shadows, and I'm going to build a scene around it so we can do a couple of renders here in just a moment. It's one of those things where you can follow along if you want to, or you can just watch if you want to. Okay, so here are our five light types, and if you need to change these around on your end, you can do this at any time by selecting a light, and under its object data... First, you have the preview window, which can help you a bit to figure out what your light is going to be looking like. Also, uh, let me turn this back over to GLSL. It just looks nicer. And I guess I need to turn screen casting on yet again because I crashed. There we go. And we'll hit Alt-Z so now you can kind of see something coming out there. Okay. Uh, so, you can jump between each one of these. I want to take just a second and jot down what each of these are and generally what they're used for. Now, please understand, I could teach an entire class, like seriously, like a multi-week class, specifically over lighting and lighting styles. And today, we're going to keep things relatively generic just because we have a lot of things to cover. But, here are your light styles. First off, we have point lights. I'm not even going to write this out. If you, uh, have, if you have your notes, you see that I've kind of written a definition down. But just think of this like a single point in space that's going to pump light out in all directions, including popping out at you. <laughs> now next, we have a sunlight. Now sunlight is giving you a simulation of a light source that is extremely big and extremely far away, kind of like the sun. But it's not exactly like the sun. In fact, it's a mathematically perfect rendition of the sun because all of the beams of light in a sunlight are parallel to one another. Why is that fancy? Well, only lasers do that, really. Uh, generally, a light source is going to have divergent beams of light because you have a source and that light just kind of goes in all directions. And the reason this is important is if you have something that casts a shadow, say a character or a person or whatever, that shadow is going to have a divergent shadow. It's going to actually get bigger going out from its, its source. However, with a sunlight, that's not what happens. Your shadow is also going to stay nice and straight and parallel, like it would from the sun, uh, which, I mean, we all know that mathematically that's not exactly what happens, but it, it does help for your scenes if you need something to look like something from, uh, from outside. Also, something to keep in mind about the sunlight is it's kind of like a, a directional light in Maya with benefits. It allows you to add in sky color. 
So you can start by giving your light a general color, but then you can tweak that by bringing in a little bit of color uh, from a, a sky that you can actually set. And you can also control things like uh, how dense the atmosphere is, so uh, how many, how, like how thick the participating media particles, like the air density is, to kind of help diffuse the light. you got a lot of controls for that sort of thing, which is really, really neat. Something else, and this is just one of those random tidbits true of just about every 3D application out there, whenever you're dealing with these parallel directional lights, position is irrelevant. Because it simulates a source that's infinitely far away anyway, you can really put these wherever you want to. I mean, generally, if I'm doing like a sunlight, I often will position it up in the sky so I know to look there. Uh, but that's not a hard and fast rule. You can generally put these wherever you want. Does Blender <coughs> treat the scale parameter on lights as, as a, a fall off, or does it ignore it? It depends on the light, actually. Uh, now, scale will for have... Sunlight, yeah, for sunlight, for Yeah, for sunlight, I don't think so. Though I've never I've really felt a desire to scale up a sunlight, because it's usually simulating a sun. Yeah, no, I just, in sometimes, kind of two diametrically opposed ways of treating scale of an object when it's a light. Sure, sure. And next we have a spotlight, and this is uh, pretty much exactly what you think it is. It is a single point that fires out a cone of light. So think, you know, theatrical spotlight, think searchlight, headlight, flashlight, anything like that that fires out a cone of light, there's your spot. And you have the ability to control that cone. You can control not only the overall angle of that cone, but you can control a secondary angle as well that goes out from this where you get kind of a softening. So if you don't want your uh, your actual light to be razor sharp, you have a second cone where you can create some fuzziness on the outside of it, make it look a lot more diffused, a penumbra angle. But again, the spotlight's extremely straightforward. Next, we have the hemi light. Short for hemisphere, this simulates a dome of light. That's pointing inwards. Yeah, pointing inward. So, it, basically, if you were standing inside a dome of light, it would be illuminating you basically from all sides. It's really nice as a way to kind of control the color of shadows. Generally, not something you're going to want to have turned up very bright, because it really will flatten your scenes out pretty harshly. Uh, but if you're just trying to make things look a little more natural to simulate some bounce light, uh, as opposed to having to calculate it every single frame, a hemisphere light can be a nice way to get that effect very quickly and very cheaply on your renders. And finally, we have an area light. And an area light allows you to simulate an actual rectangular surface that would be emitting light. So something like a TV screen. Or like an actual light fixture. If you have like a fluorescent light fixture in your house, then generally you'll put like that uh, sheet across them so it diffuses the light like a great big rectangle of light. And you can do the same thing with an area light. These lead to very, very soft shadows, but they're a bit more expensive than uh, other forms of light. So it's just a quick rundown of, uh, of the various light types. Does Blender support IBL? Honestly, off the top of my head, I don't know. Okay, now uh, jumping back over into Blender. What I want to do real quick is set up a scene, and it's, again, one of those things where you're welcome to follow along and do the same thing if you want to. I've got my flat plane. I've got a single light. I'm going to hit Shift-A and bring in a UV sphere. I'm immediately going to smooth that sphere out because I don't want to look at all those extra faces. Jump over to one of the side views and notice that I still have some image planes, or really rough image planes anyway, so let me go ahead and kill those out. And I'm going to set this sphere right on top of the grid. So that it's more or less sitting right on our surface here. Now if you look through your camera, hopefully you've got something about like so. Uh, if you need to uh, waggle your camera around a little bit to aim it directly up the, the sphere, you don't have to do that, but if you want to, you can. So just like control alt zero, and that was close, but not close enough. So we'll zoom out a little bit. That looks pretty good. Now, the only other thing I'm going to do, and this is more for vanity's sake than anything else, I'm going to put a material on my sphere, so it's not just plain Jane, uh, gray on gray, and pick a color, any color. I'll use a, a nice 
brilliant red. So there is a very, very simple render. What I want to talk about now is the concept of three-point lighting. Now, anybody in here, has anybody in here actually heard of three-point lighting? Actually, no, 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 let me flip that question around. Has anybody in here never heard of three-point lighting? Like, you're totally new to it. I'm curious. Tell me, please. Let me know. I'm just going to... You can tell me in BuzzNet, by the way. I am looking at BuzzNet. Got one person who's new to it, so everybody else, I'm assuming, has seen it at some point. Heard of it, not really used, never heard of. Okay, well, that's good. Uh, once again, guys, if you um, hear me go silent for just a second, or if you hear no feedback whatsoever from my end, do not be alarmed. I'm doing that on purpose uh, to hide how bad my allergies are right now. Uh, somebody just asked a question. Fadgav said, would you use a Hemi in preference to having any official ambient light, uh, ignoring available uh, proc power? You know, Gav, you can just ask questions. Yeah, but it was a proper question question. I didn't know if you'd <laughs> no, get into it later. No, it's, it's okay. Uh, yeah, you're, you're welcome to just ask questions if you want to. And with the lag issues and that, I, I understand. It's sometimes it's easier just to, me to type and you can get to it. Yeah, get to it. I understand. I understand. Uh, so, well, generally I use Hemis for that kind of thing. Uh, you can create an official ambient light if you want to, if you know that that light needs to have a specific direction. Uh, but if you're just trying to get a simple flooding, so to speak, of light everywhere, then uh, it can be kind of handy to throw in a Hemi. But you do have to be well, just, you have to be really careful of them because they do kill off a lot of depth in your scene if you're not careful. Yeah, but just, you know, I I, saw, I learned that most of what I know from watching your videos, so uh, I've kind of got your with the ambient lighting and. Don't ever, don't. Yeah, it's like, okay, uh, I... It's not real. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, you know, never is a really, really strong word. Uh, and I, I use them, but very rarely and just a little bit. Like, if I have an ambient light or a hemi light, I'll have it with just a little bit of juice behind it, just a little bit of energy. And that's kind of what we're going to be doing today once we get into lighting our scene. It just, it helps keep our shadow color. Uh, what is the equivalent of mental ray, physical sun, and sky in Maya? That would be the sunlight. Uh, because, uh, And that's the closest it's got, because it's, it actually has just the sun-style properties, and it has some light color, which, uh, just to point that out, let me back out a little bit. If we grab this light, and I switch it over to a sunlight, you take a look, it actually has some sky and atmosphere settings, so you can turn on a sky for it. And there, the turbidity is how dense the air is. You can also change uh, the atmosphere. But that's really the closest thing it has at the moment. Is the sky procedurally generated, or can you use a, a texture? It is procedurally generated. And it's really just there to affect your lighting uh, more than anything else. Uh, here, hang on, let me turn this it's not like drop. It's not like a, a max skylight where you can you see where it's, it now my, use the background for illumination. Yeah, well, you you can see now that I've got like some, you know, nice sickly greenish blue color in the background. Um, and if I jump out of here and just for temporary sake, just kind of flip that up and hit F12 again, there's my sky once again. And that's with the desert preset. So I can switch that over to mountain and render again and see now I've got a little bit of blue haze coming in. So it's just adjusting some presets. Okay, now back over to the topic at hand. Let me see if I can get this kind of lined up. That looks pretty good. Okay, so three-point lighting. For those of you who are completely new to it, I think it's time to take some notes. Do I have any room left to take notes? Oh, I got some room over here. Three-point lighting, as you might have gathered, is going to require three lights. So you have your subject, this thing that you're going to be lighting, a character. Your first light is going to be the key light. And I don't know why I was going to spell that L-I-T something. <laughs> As opposed to full fat. Yeah, that's okay. The purpose of the key light is to provide your primary illumination. 
Uh, essentially, if anybody looks at your image, and by the way, three-point lighting is not just for 3D rendering, folks. You can use it for photography. You can use it when painting. Anytime you actually need to light anything, uh, even in your home, if you have something like a nice you know, piece of pottery or something set up somewhere, uh, you can actually use three-point lighting to help kind of make it pop a little bit. So your key light is there so that when people look at something, that's going to be the light that they pretty much focus on. That's the primary light that is illuminating your subject. Your next light, and what I'm going to do actually uh, is we're going to turn this into a bird's eye view. So, and then we'll say that he's pointing this way just for this sake. Though he could be pointing in all kinds of different directions. And let's say here's our camera. So we have a key light, and then we have our next light, which is called a fill light. Now your fill light's job is essentially to help keep your shadows from being too dark. Uh, because your key light is going to be casting some shadows. So like if I have, just as an example, I have like a, a character, and he's being lit from over here by a key light. By default, he's going to get some really harsh shadows across his face. All of this area on this side will be nice and bright, but all this will be really, really dark. And I know it's kind of funny to color shadows with a white pen, but still, you can go with me on that. So the purpose of the fill light is just to lighten these shadows up so that these aren't perfectly black. Now this means that generally, and this is all generally because you're going to be changing these around on a on a case by case basis, but generally your fill light is going to be a little bit dimmer than your key light. Then finally, your third light, and this actually go, has a, a few different names. I've heard it called a rim light, I've heard it called a backlight. I'm calling it a backlight in this example. We have the backlight. And the, back the backlight's job is to sit somewhere back behind the subject and create a nice highlight around the rim of something, just to kind of help make it pop a little bit. So let's take a look at setting this up inside a blender. So, of course, right now we have our single light, which we could, for sake of demonstration, assume that this is going to be our key light. Let's go ahead and name it. So up here in my outliner, we have just the basic lamp. I'm just going to call this the key light. Now, currently, this has some uh, some shadows set up. If you want things to look kind of nice, uh, and to kind of jump around a little bit in my notes, we've already got a ray shadow set up. And you'll see that we've already got a soft size of one. The purpose of soft size is to take those shadows and make them not quite so harsh, to soften them up. So, off the top of your head, uh, you might be thinking, well, if the soft size is 1, why is our shadow razor sharp? Well, the answer is simple. We only are using one sample. As you increase these samples, like here's a sample of 2, I render again, oh, now we have this kind of chunky, fuzzy scariness coming off the back of our shadow. And if we click that up to 3 and hit one more time, it's starting to get a little better. I generally will put this, like, for, for previews, I'll have it up around 8, and then if I want something to look uh, a whole lot better, I'll double that to about 16. And of course, you, you know, your mileage may vary. You can set it to all kinds of different things. Now, with 16 samples, we can also adjust our soft size a little. So, like, if I set this all the way up to something like 2, this should be just... There you go. You see a lot more softening taking place around the edge of that shadow. Could you do something just for me? What do you need, boss? <laughs> Could you uh, subdivide that sphere so the nickeling goes away? Oh, no, you're, is the nickeling driving you crazy, man? All right. It is. All right, all right. <laughs> well, just for you, I will drop on a subdivision surface modifier. And Thank you, Zach. Yeah, th there you go. Just so that Gavin feels better. Now our renders actually take a lot longer, um, so you guys can thank Gav. Uh, I'm not getting any shadow on my plane. Well, okay, here's something to check. Uh, if you have added your light, if this is a brand new light for you, uh, you may want to take a look at it. First off, does it have that second little dashed halo around it to tell you that it's casting shadows? Make sure that under shadows you are set to ray shadow. And 
then make no. Yes. Yeah, okay, I got no and yes. So if it doesn't have that halo, then it's not casting shadows. Watch it right now. If I click it to no shadow, that halo disappears. Actually, I'd like to turn this back over to a plain Jane uh, point light for now, which I need to do another quick render and see what that looks like. Ah, so much nicer. Are you? Is, are you? Have you limited the layers it's affecting? Yeah, hopefully uh, you haven't clicked anything like this layer only, but if all of your objects are on the same layer, then that won't matter anyway. Uh, you also don't want to click that for ray shadow either. Actually, let's just take a look at your screen. That's what we're going to do. All right, Annie, when... Ooh, I hear clicking. There's your screen. You're, you're on my mom. You're on my mom's computer. My uh, The blender is on my laptop. Okay. So uh, so you can't see my screen. Okay. <laughs> well, that doesn't help us at all, does it? I know, I know. <laughs> you can say hi to my mom, though. <laughs> hi, Mom. Hi, Annie's mom. That's a really nice desktop, though. Okay. Yeah, it, it is, it is. I apologize, but that was the only way I could do it, do two things. Okay, yeah, no worries, no worries. All right, well, I'll go ahead and take uh, control back. It was worth a shot. It was worth a shot. Thank you so much. I'm not, I'm not in Austin. I'm in East Texas. Yeah, no worries, no worries. Okay. okay, so I'll jump back, and here we go. So, yeah, off the top of my head, if you're not getting any shadows, let's just try this. You know, um, in a worst-case scenario, take your light, nuke it. Oh no, it's so dark, I'm scared. Uh, let's create a brand new lamp. So, point light, hit G, pull it up into the air. And let's just get this positioned. So, I'll put it somewhere over here. And what happens if I hit F12? Okay, well, we've got something. And then let's make sure that we turn on ray shadow. And press F12 again. And now we've got shadows, which is good. And let's see, from here we could kick our samples back up to about 16 and set our soft size up to about 2 and just press F12 again. <laughs> I've just noticed Robert was, Robert was having his heart, he was having half of the conversation with you that you were having with Annie. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm going to move my uh, light around a little bit, say about like so, so it's up above but not quite so high above. Let's go ahead and press F12. There's some really harsh from the side lighting. Okay, my shadow is very, very faint. Any tips on that? Yes, my tips on that are for you to show me how faint your shadow is. That's my tip. So let's take a look. Let's see why your shadow is so faint, Mohammed. Do, 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 do. Show me. Click the button. Uh, yeah, hang on a second. Hang on a second. No, One, two, I'm two. impatient. Do it now. Done. But you got to show me your screen. Oh, there we go. Oh, you're using a, you're use, still using a sunlight right now, which is really kind of blowing out everything in your scene. Uh, so. Do, 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 do. Hang on, I've double checked it. I've double checked it. There you go. Okay, so point um, light. That point. Is a point light. It is a point light. Well, you you got some uh, extra illumination taking place. Let's see here. Delete that light and do another render. Kill it. Make it go away. Uh, okay, hang on. Um and. Good. You Everything should be. Ah, uh, yes. Take a look at this. Come out. Uh, there's your. There's your question. You're clicking stuff. You see ambient occlusion. Oh, I why, why have you? Why have you turned uh, on ambient occlusion? By the way, I cannot. Uh, I cannot hear you because of the rendering right now. <laughs> we can't hear you either. So it's great. Hit escape. It's, no, it's okay. okay. No, I hit the escape. There button. you go. You've, I hit the escape. You've, I've done it. I hit it. There you go. Scroll down. Scroll down uh, in your properties right now. Why, why is ambient occlusion on? 
Scroll up now. You've gone too far. I couldn't scroll up now. Okay, there you go. Scrolled up more. Why is ambient occlusion on? Ah, there you go. Found, found it. And, and it's set to <laughs> add. When you set ambient occlusion to add, it'll brighten your scene up significantly. So you don't necessarily want to do that. Yeah, actually... Go ahead. Yeah, actually, I'm working on the same project on the same file which I had. I just simply moved to another layer, uh -huh. and apparently, I moved, I took everything with me along to the other layer. So, I haven't paid any attention. So well, much. although I had enough sleep. Yeah, no worries at all. But uh, do keep in mind that when you turn on ambient occlusion and you try to render out your grass, you need you're gonna need to walk away from your computer for a very long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's also that's also one thing I have to do that too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But anyway, let's. Um, yeah. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna follow along if you would like to take off the, all right. the control. All please. right. Here we go. Then I'll go take it right back from you. Mm -hmm. Once I figure out how. There we go. That looks good. I'm back. <laughs> So, yeah, just definitely don't turn on uh, ambient occlusion just now. It's still a little early for that. Okay, so we've already got our primary light. That's a little bit too much from the, the side for me for this example. So uh, real quick, just relative to the camera, uh, I, can, I can move that around. If we hit Alt-Z, I can reposition. So maybe something kind of like that. And we'll zoom back in, do one last little quick render. Ah, that looks fantastic. So there's our key light. But the problem with just that one light is that we have these really, really, really dark shadows. I mean, you, don't, you generally don't see shadows that dark. Now, in some cases, and I'm not going to say in every case, but every so often, you may be inclined to change your shadow color. You can do that. You can actually make your shadows like a little gray. And then when you do a render... You get something like this, but then the the next problem is that the back side of your object is still dark. See, that's not actually a shadow. That's just actually the lighting on the surface itself. That's different than a cast shadow, and that's something you got to kind of keep in mind uh, when you're working in 3D. But let's go ahead and leave our shadows at black. Generally, I try not to change the color of my shadows ever. If I need to change the color of my shadows, I try to do it the way I do it in the real world, which is just with another light. So I'm going to hit Shift-D and bring in another light, which I'll bring to the opposite side, and then move down a bit. Kind of close to the ground. And let's name this as well. So we have Point, which we'll go ahead and name Key Light, with a capital I for some reason. And then this one will make fill light. And do another render. Now currently both of these are casting shadows, and that's one of those things that you may need to figure out on your own whether or not you actually want your, uh, your fill light to cast shadows. Sometimes you will, sometimes you may want to turn those off. Now this is a little bit harsh. I'm really not a big fan of this little dark triangle we're getting here on the lower part of my object. So to kill that... I'm going to move my fill light a little bit around to the front, and it looks like I need to bring it up a little bit. And do another quick test render. So a little bit left. I'm okay with just maybe a little bit, but the problem now is that it's just too even. And this is one of those things. You're generally not going to allow your fill light to have the same brightness as your key light. So let's pull this down. So pull this to about 0.4. And that's becoming a lot more subtle on this side, maybe even a little lower than that. So let's try something like uh, 0.3. All right, nice. And the only other thing we could do at this point, if we wanted to, would be to bring out this outer edge of our object, which we're going to do with a backlight, which you'll hear called several uh, names, depending on what you read or who you talk to. I've heard it called a rim light, a glint light, uh, all kinds of stuff. But we're just going to take our key light, duplicate it off again with Shift-D, and I'll move it back here behind my object. Now, if you hit... Alt-Z, so you can see the lighting at least on your object. You can move this guy around so that that specular highlight is right there where you need it to be. Now I would... I was gonna, go ahead, please. I was going to say, on the fill light, and apologies if I'm moving ahead. I can sure. Thing, but um, uh, would you normally kill off specular on that? It depends. I, take, I handle that on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, sometimes okay. I actually like seeing that extra specular highlight. Other times I don't. 
so I try not to tell people as a hard and fast rule to kill that because I've seen okay. I've seen folks kind of take that to heart. And, you know, sometimes that will make certain objects look a little weird, but you can. And so um, if you turn that off now and do another render, and again, that's just a setting there in your lights. You just switch off specular. And now the light is illuminating. It's casting diffuse light, but it's not calculating specularity, which can be very handy. So it's important that you know you can do that. Yeah, because I, I, I habitually turn off specular and shadows for, for the fill light. Gotcha. All right, and uh, Annie just said, I got F12 to work on my laptop, and it does show shadow. Okay, excellent. Good, good, good. And actually, we've got our, our little backlight working now as well. Now, generally, I will not make my backlight show a shadow on simple objects. If you have something that's really complex, it can be useful to turn on shadowing so that you don't get any really weird uh, highlights in places you shouldn't have them. So it's one of those things where you kind of have to play it by ear. And just look at your surface. Where do you need to see that highlight show up? Now, there is something interesting happening here that will annoy you when you're first setting this up, and that is, look at this. Look what that backlight is doing to our background, and it's blowing out our shadows here. It's causing actually a second shadow down here underneath our object. That's all terrible. We don't want that to happen. The way we're going to fix that is to make clever use of layers. Now, pay attention. This is one of those things that you can mess up. I did write it down in the notes for anybody who needs it. Uh, but to make things a little easier, it looks like I've already been using like the, the last layer for some whatever reason. So I'm going to move everything over to the first layer, kind of like a default setting, right? So now my entire scene exists here. Now, in the case of this render, what I want to have happen, just to, to bring it back up so everybody can see it, Do, do, do. is I want my backlight to not affect the ground. I only want it to affect my subject. And so that's where we can start getting into selective lighting. Something you can do in 3D that you can't do anywhere else is control what lights are affecting what. You can actually say that if I have a little light bulb, wow, well, it's casting light in my scene. And I have two objects. I've got a box and a sphere right next to it. I can tell the light to illuminate the box, but do not illuminate the sphere. And we can handle that with the use of layers. Now, uh, I saw a question roll through. Somebody said, please explain specularity. When you light an object up, you have an area that is dark. And often, you'll have this piece of shininess. The reflection of the light. That is known as a specular highlight. Specularity is literally controlling a simulation of micro faceting across the surface of an object. And that's a great, you get to use like big long words like micro faceting. Uh, in short, it's how glossy or how shiny something is. Uh, so if we jump back over to Blender, and we grab our, let's just grab our sphere and jump over to its materials. We have a little specular area. Now, inside of this, we can control how this is being calculated. And these are all scientists who uh, studied light and came up with their own way that this should all be calculated. But ignoring that, we've got things like hardness currently set to 50. Notice as I increase hardness, my specular highlight gets smaller. And what that's doing is simulating if this was becoming a much glossier surface, like something like glass, maybe. And we get that all up to 511, which is as hard as it possibly goes. And you can see this, the uh, highlights here getting much tinier, as if this surface just became a whole lot shinier. Now, as I take it down lower, that specular highlight gets a whole lot bigger. And now suddenly, this doesn't look all glossy anymore. It looks like, you know, maybe uh, not quite like brushed steel, but something... Rubber ball? Yeah, like a... Well, even that's way too much even for a rubber ball. For a rubber ball, I'd pull it way down. Uh, because uh, rubber doesn't... Well, I guess it depends on the kind of rubber, yeah, yeah. doesn't it? But it just it depends on the surface. Uh, the idea, though, is that at the microscopic level smaller than your eye can see, you'll have all these little tiny indentations across the surface which spread your specular highlight out. 
So, you know, like metal will tend to do this. So if you want something to be metallic, you generally want a larger specular highlight. And actually, for metal, you will also generally want to tint your specular highlight just a little bit. So in this case, you want to add a little bit of red to it. Okay, so that's your quick rundown of specularity. Now let's jump back over to setting up our light uh, to work with, uh, with our scene properly. Now this is a pretty basic thing. What we're going to do is take our light and put it in its own layer. So I'll press M, and I'm just going to move it to the next layer over. Now suddenly that light is no longer working at all. It's like it just disappears. What we need to do is make sure that in our scene we're looking at both of these layers. So hold down Shift and click on that second layer, like so. Next, take the subject you're lighting, and we're not going to change its layer. We're going to hold down Shift and also add it to the same layer as your backlight. So did you get that? We're going to take our, our light itself and make sure that it's only in its own layer. We'll take the subject and make sure it's in its original layer and also in the same layer as the backlight. Then finally, take your backlight and tell it to illuminate this layer only. Now, and you can already see this in the viewport, how great is that? You can see it's creating a specular highlight on the object, but it's not illuminating the ground at all. And now if we do a render, there you have it. We've got our little rim light around the edge, we have our primary fill light, we've got our shadows, and our shadows are being cleaned up a little bit by that fill. Actually, I'd probably pull my fill down a little and let it be a little dimmer, uh, which we can do here, because I can select it. Let's take this, we'll name this backlight. This is also one of the nice things about Blender's user interface and naming conventions, because we can go right here and just select our lights and start playing with their energy levels and colorization. It's not a bad idea to always colorize your lights just a little, uh, as opposed to always leaving your lights pure white. Very seldom do you ever find lights uh, in, the, in the real world that are 100% perfectly white. That only happens in a computer. So it's a good idea, just a good habit, to take your lights and tint them something. Uh, so like we could take our, our key light and give that just a little bit of a warm tint. It doesn't have to be even visible. It can just be felt more than seen the tiniest little bit of color. And then maybe take our fill light, and maybe that's a cooler light. So we'll put just a little bit of blue in there. To most people, it's still going to appear white, but it can make all the difference in the world in giving you some nice subtle hues uh, across your surfaces, because that's more like what you see in the real world. And we'll also make our backlight a little cool as well. And that's coming in much nicer. Yeah, <laughs> these sorts of adjustments. If, if, if you can see it in the color swatch, you that's you're, you're verging on um, too much color. Yeah, and, yeah, correct. exactly. A white light with a bit of color. Right. If, if, if I've done that so many times, particularly with the black end of the spectrum. Right. If you're trying to set shadows and things like that. If you it, what looks right in the little color swatch, generally does doesn't necessarily look right. Either. Yeah, once it's actually rendered. Did you? Yeah, it's just one of those things you gotta you have to play with, and that's the whole thing with lighting. You're gonna tweak and render, and tweak and render, and tweak and render. Now, something else, Just this is a tip, and this is true of, I think, every 3D package out there. Remember that changing the color of your light is one thing, but you also have the ability to change the uh, brightness of the light using its value. So if you know you need a dim light, you can take its color and set it down to some darker shade of gray as opposed to a, a bright white color, and then use your energy just to fine tune it. And just using kind of a nice uh, sort of back and forth, you can really uh, you can really help clean up your lighting uh, just by having a tiny little amount of, of control over energy. Basically, by setting this to gray, your energy slider becomes a, uh, it's kind of like a, a fine tuning knob to get your light to just the right kind of brightness. So I said value, not brightness. Yeah, I, well, <laughs> thank you, Miranda. <laughs> but yeah, the idea here is we're using the value of our light color, almost like applying a tint or like a, like tinting the windows, putting a, a black shade or a black gel or a, a gray gel, I suppose, over our light to dim it down a little and then use energy from there. It's just, a, it's a trick that I've used in a lot of different 3D packages if I know I need a dim light, but uh, I don't want to have to really make sweeping changes to things like brightness or energy levels. Just something I use. Okay, so that is 
ex uh, essentially my discussion over three point lighting. It's one of the simplest forms of lighting. There's all kinds of different ways to light subjects. This is just one of them. Uh, but I wanted to make sure that you guys did get a chance to see that. Now, what I'd like to do is take a quick break and then uh, we can actually get into lighting our scenes. So I'm going to go ahead and pause the video at this point. Okay, we are back. Now, during the pause, you'll notice that Blender has suddenly changed uh, and is now showing my scene. Actually, that's because during the, uh, the off hours, so <laughs> during the break, actually, I had a Blender crash. And rather than rebuild my scene, I was like, you know what, let's just move on to the next part of our lesson because we're already done talking about three-point lighting anyway. Now, I did get a question that popped in. I uh, said, should your key light set in front or back of your camera? Eh, you know, it's one of those things that you're going to have to play with. It depends on uh, the zoom factor of your camera, the positioning of everything. Often, mine is set back behind my camera, but that's not a hard and fast rule. Uh, it's just going to depend on exactly where you want the illumination and the initial shading to fall across the surface of your character. Uh, if you're using something like a, uh, a spotlight, you may need to get it close to get the divergence of light that you need to really get the illumination you really, really need. It's just one of those things you'll handle on a case-by-case -case basis. You might have noticed, like, in terms of lighting, lighting is one of those artistic things um, where the technicalities of working with the lights, their settings and all that sort of stuff, that's all concrete. That's all mathematical. And you can set some hard and fast rules about what you should and shouldn't do. Uh, for the positioning of lights, it's more like guidelines. It's more intuitive. It's an artistic process where you are suddenly kind of, you're kind of painting in brightness and shadow into your scene and using lights as your brush. <clears throat> okay. So, back to the lecture at hand. Our next thing is going to be to light our scenes. Currently, I have my animation all set to go. And you guys probably think I sound like a robot right now. Ooh, I need to check my settings. Um, escape. I don't know what's going on, but it shouldn't take this long to render. Uh, no, it should, I guess. It's probably just that grass. You know what I'm going to do? Just for the sake of our render and our sanity... Let me jump into my particle system for the grass, and at the moment, uh, we've got our children, and our render set to 150. Let me pull this way down. Let me see if I can get away with something like just 50 for now. Let me see what this render's like, because hopefully that should speed things up quite a bit. Yeah, that's fine, because uh, we can always kick it back up later. Now, if you see something like this, this is pretty much what you want, because remember, we told our backdrop to be shadeless. It ignores lighting, which means it's always going to appear to be illuminated. That's very handy, and if you don't do that, then you'll have to find some way to light your backdrop, uh, because, uh, actually, well, watch out for that, too, because you'll have, like, an area of the sky that is brighter, and then it gets dimmer, like it really is painted onto a concrete wall. So, generally, it's a good idea uh, to make sure that you turn on... Shadeless. Okay, so back over into our scene. The first thing we're going to do is add in a sunlight. So wherever your 3D cursor happens to be, I'm just going to drop mine somewhere right about here is fine. We'll go ahead and hit Shift A, jump over to Lamp, and add in a sun. Now we need to get this positioned. Now here's the, the fun thing I want to show you guys. Uh, somebody was asking earlier today if there's a way to make the view kind of become the camera. Yes, there is, and you can do it with a lot of different things too, including lights, and I love working with lights this way, especially spotlights. But we're going to do it with a sun just, you know, because it's fun to do. And with this selected, I'll press the N key. Now, finding this setting, um, for those of you who have a hard time, like, keeping up with me when I start digging through settings, I press the N key to open up my properties panel in the 3D view. Underneath view, you'll see lock camera to view. But actually, before we even do that, we need to uh, go into our 3D view, go under view, go under cameras, and set the active object as the camera. It's also control number pad zero, but I just want you guys to see where the option is. Once you click this, you're now looking through this light. The problem is, as soon as you uh, move the view, you move away from it. So you got to do this. Go to cameras, set active object as camera, then lock the camera to the view. Now the great thing is you can just move your view around like you always do, and what you're doing is actually changing your lighting. 
Now, something that is pretty handy, uh, if you want to set this up as well, I'm going to try to make the most of this. Notice, uh, folks, that I have very, very limited screen space, but I'm going to take my outliner, and I'm going to split it in half. I'll take the upper portion, and we're going to turn this into a 3D view. I'll press the zero key, and right now we're still looking through that light, which is not exactly what I want. So here's what we're going to do. In the outliner, select my actual camera, then go to view here in the tiny little 3D view, and go to cameras, and choose set active object as camera. Now the great thing about doing that is that you can have a little tiny view through the camera up here in the corner of your scene. In fact, we can go ahead and hide out the menu bar here. We don't really need to see it. And we'll zoom in just a little bit. So we can see how everything looks. Let's hit Alt-Z. And I'm also going to come over here and very carefully, because I know I'm kind of limited on size and everything, make sure that GLSL is on so we can actually see the result of some lighting. And press N. Now over here, See what's happening? As I move my view around, I'm actually updating the lighting in the upper right-hand corner of my screen. Nice. This is a really handy way to handle lights because uh, a handy way to handle lights uh, because you can you can kind of work with them more like a light technician in the real world. If you had a light technician in the real world who had like a zero gravity belt that he could wear and float around like Baron Harkonnen or something. Five points if that reference made you grin. Thank you. <laughs> Zero points if it did not. All right. So uh, anyway, just take your key light. Now, does anybody? I'm just. I'm just asking because I'm trying to be nice. Uh, would anybody like me to show you how to set this scenario back up one more time? Just be nice. Or do you all have it? Say something. Uh, give me some feedback over in Buzznet. Yes, please. Okay. So just because I can't be rewound when I'm live, I'll do this one more time. But it is in your notes. Okay. So. Um, Definitely keep that in mind. Okay, so let me turn off lock camera to view here, and we'll just kind of move away. So I have my sunlight. We can just pretend that I just added that. As a matter of fact, if you really kind of want to reset it, we just take its rotation and set it back over to zero so it's pointing straight down. Select your light. Under the view menu, go to cameras and set active object as camera. Notice that's also control numpad zero. So you can just select it and hit control zero, and you're looking through it already. Now all you need to do is lock camera to view. That's found under your properties panel in the 3D view. Press the N key and look under view. You'll see lock camera to view. Now you can just move your view around like always, and you're updating your lighting. But you want to see what that looks like through the camera, obviously. You need to see if your lighting is going to render well. So take your outliner and just split it like you do. We'll take that upper outliner we just created, and we're going to turn that into a 3D view. Now, this 3D view needs to be looking through our actual camera. So one way or another, select that camera. So just click on it or select it in the outliner, whatever suits your fancy. Go back under view, back under cameras, and it, or just hit control numpad zero again, because now you want to set the active camera back to the camera. That's important. Zoom in, you can hide away the little title bar at the bottom. Just handle that however you need to, to show exactly what you need to see. Then, a couple of things you need to make certain of. One, make sure that you have GLSL under display active, because that's going to show you your lighting. And then, hit Alt-Z, and there's the result of your lighting. So now, as you move around in the big viewport, you're positioning your light, and you get that cute little preview in the upper corner, showing you what everything looks like. So there you go. Now, with that done, uh, we need to... Uh, let's see, what kind of settings are... I don't think I even worry too much about the settings for this. The defaults are actually going to be okay. I do invite, implore, beg, ask, plead uh, for you guys to experiment with these and get used to them. What I'm going to do, though, is take my light, jump over to its settings, and I'm going to give this just a little bit of a warm value. That's way too warm. I... The, Ooh. It went crazy. I mean, I clicked here, but then it read something off my mouse that I didn't mean for it to. It read something off your mind. Yeah, uh, there pink. you go. It must be pink. Absolutely. So, uh, there's the, the big thing we're going to do. Also, 
we can go ahead and turn on shadows for this. Uh, so maybe just switch on standard ray shadow. I'm not going to worry too much about my shadow settings at the moment because our shadows are being scattered by the grass you're going to find. So softening those up may not even be worth your while, uh, but it'll just depend on how the shadows are falling across the character's face and all that kind of thing. We'll, we'll gauge that a little bit later. Okay, so for our next light, we're going to add a hemisphere light. And let's, kinda, let's hit a render real quick and take, maybe take a look at why. Hopefully this won't take too long. Now, uh, my grass, I've turned way down so we don't have to wait all day for a render. Please keep that in mind. Uh, that's why we can see the edge of the hill here. That's why the, the grass looks kind of thin and gross and why we can see the, the black ground and everything. Generally, you won't want this to happen. But if I were you, I would set my lighting up so that it looked good on the character and don't stress the grass too terribly much. The grass can pretty much come along for the ride. And... Uh, I'm going to pause the video real quick. Everyone hang on for just a moment. There we go. And we're back. And I'm really glad I didn't mess up my uh, my mute buttons on that one. Okay. <laughs> so, allergies, man. They're great. Iron Soul just crashed, by the way. <clears throat> Iron Soul just crashed? Yeah. He's straining to remember how to recover autosave. Oh, yeah. Well, it's going to depend on where you have uh, Blender installed. But if you go under the, the file menu, you should have... Oh, he said... You should have recover it says, autosave. It's cool, I got it. Okay, yeah. Recover autosave should get you where you want to go. I mean, if you're actually looking for the file. but Anyway, let's press F11, and let's bring in our second light. Also, folks, um, it's a good idea. Just hit Control-S a lot. Just save a lot. <laughs> you know, and That way, this kind of thing won't, uh, won't affect you too much. All right, so now we're going to add in another light. So we hit Shift-A, and this time we'll bring in a Hemi light. Now, what did I say about hemisphere lights? Definitely, you know, don't be too scared of using them, but keep it subtle. Don't really crank these up, because right now, just by adding that, if I hit render... Our scene loses a really good chunk of its depth, as you can see here. It's just really, really way, way, way too bright. What we're going to do is use this Hemi light as a way to simulate a sky. Yes, I know the sunlight has a sky setting. We're not going to well on that. We're not going to make use of that at the moment. So, with our Hemi selected, set its color to something fairly cool. If you can actually see it as a sky color, then it's too much. Just a little bit of cooling light. That's it. That's all you need. Even that's a little heavy-handed, but we'll try it out anyway. The next big thing is to make sure you pull your energy down. We're going to pull this down to 0.35. Now, like everything when we're doing these scenes, most of you have about the same uh, scene scale that I do. You've built all of your objects to about the exact same sizes that I have. But, like all artistic things, your mileage may vary. So if you do a render and you decide that your shadows are a little too dark or a little too light, adjust the energy accordingly. Do what looks right for you. And you see our shadows are now starting to, to uh, come back in, but they're quite brightened up. We can still see the shadow on the grass there, and that's looking pretty good. Okay, now, finally, we're going to put in a rim light. Now, for this particular example, um, in this file, I believe, I had killed off specularity. If you have a little bit of specularity on your uh, character, then your rim light will make a lot more sense. If you have no specularity, then you might not even need a rim light. So it's one of those things that I'll just kind of leave up to you. I'm going to turn on specularity, more or less, just so we can create one. I'm also going to take this light and move it straight up into the sky, right over the hill, just so I always know kind of where it's going to be. Also a good idea to start naming things, which I've been kind of lazy about. So we'll call this our... Fill light. We'll call this our so, key light. Yes, sir? <clears throat> so does the position of the actual uh, Hemi light matter or not? Is it calculating just... No. No, it's it should be... Because that... Yeah, to the best of my knowledge, it doesn't. Um, I, let me try moving it. Seems counterintuitive to me. What it seems counterintuitive? I, that it doesn't matter? I can kind of... I think it depends on, on how they're running the math calculation, really. We'll know here in just a second. I can see with directional lights why it wouldn't, but because it's a Hemi light. No, it's still there. Because we're still getting some lightning of their shadows here and here. Even though it's down underneath everything. So yeah, it, its location is going to be irrelevant. I just like having it up in the air. 
Because usually, like, if I'm looking at a 3D scene, yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if I'm like, oh, where's my light? That's what I like. Yeah, yeah, my brain yeah. generally, like, wants to look up, so I always try to put my lights up in the air. Okay, so our final light is going to be our backlight. So let's do the same thing. Here's what I'm going to do. We're going to create a spotlight. So, shift A, spot. And let's do our little trick again. What do you say? Let's just hit control, zero on the number pad, and then we'll lock the, the camera to the view. And then we can just move this guy around wherever he needs to be. Uh, blender. No, it doesn't. It's a hemi light. I'm oh, uh, I think yeah, I think he might be talking about. Um, well, the yeah, if it's a hemisphere light, that should be all light pointed inward. Yeah. yeah, to the to the origin of the. Hemisphere. But I believe it's calculating from an infinite distance. Well, obviously, it would uh, have to be. So essentially, it's just like a shadowless light. Right. All right, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my view here to zoom in on the character, and then we can just rotate our view around so you can really position exactly how that specular highlight is going to fall on the surface. And that looks pretty good. Now, uh, if you need to, if you're having a hard time getting that to fall right on the character and on nothing else, uh, remember what we took a look at earlier with our uh, three-point lighting setup. We can take the, uh, the cone angle for this and increase it a little bit. So we have our spot shape. We can take our size and increase it from 45 degrees. Now, in this case, that's going to change the field of view of the camera. Don't let that alarm you. That's supposed to be the way that works. <clears throat> Now, when we're done with that, we can go ahead and switch off lock view to camera. I could move that around uh, manually from this point on if I need to. Then I would do a test render. <laughs> and we're rendering through that camera, obviously. So select this guy and hit control zero on the numpad. So we're rendering through the appropriate camera. And all should be well. And that's looking pretty good. Now I'm getting a couple of questions coming in. Uh, Chris Morris says, uh, when I render my ball and background are lit, but nothing else is. I think I've messed up my ball's material. Well, um, if you, Gav, if um, sorry, if you have lights in your scene, which I'm just going to assume that you do, uh, I would start checking to make sure that you haven't started working with um, layers, like you're, you don't have them uh, affecting only a single layer. Also, it'd be a good time, uh, just in that regard, to clean up your layers so you can have all of your geometry, uh, anything that actually needs to render, put all of that on the same layer. It doesn't really matter which one, just make sure it's all on the same layer. Robert Preston says, my uh, sky background is not showing up. What's going on? Well, let's see. Why would your sky not be showing up? Now, you've got it set up with the appropriate material. You've got it set to shadeless. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to think of what you could have clicked to make it go away. As I'm sure that's probably all you have done. Oh, double check your outliner. Have you done anything silly in your outliner, like select your background and tell it not to render? So you can take your backdrop and turn off its little camera icon, because if you do that and press F12, then you'll get this. I mean, Are you talking to NATO or Robert? Uh, I'm talking to Robert Preston at the moment. Um, I'm not sure, right off the top of my head, what, uh, uh, what Chris has got going on. Oh, it's, you say it's pure white. Uh, double check your texture. It seems like it might have been broken. If you need to, recreate your material real quick. Um, so, okay, now back over to NATO. When you render, your ball and background are lit and nothing else is. The only, like, the first way off the top of my head that I can think of to simulate that 
would be if your character, ooh, that's awesome, uh, if your character and your backdrop were both using like a shadeless material and you weren't using any lights in your scene, but I'm going to assume you have lights, so I would start off by making sure that all of your lights and geometry are in the same layers at the moment, and that you aren't using any uh, this layer only type of settings on your lights. And top view of my scene. Yeah, there's a top view of my scene. Chris, can you give me any more details on what's going on on your end? All right, he says uh, it renders uh, with and without lights but there isn't a shaded option on my ball club material. Okay, well, that's probably because it's using nodes. All right, well, let's just take a look at your screen. You're not set to multi-textured or something. Well, if he's rendering, it shouldn't matter. It's not one of those. Oh, right, yeah. If he's talking about the result of hitting F12, it shouldn't make any difference. Chris, you there? All right. Hello. Hello. So show me a render real quick. Might take a minute. Have you uh, turned your grass down? No. Yeah, I've turned my um, yeah, we we didn't catch any of that. Coming through, uh, was... we we didn't catch anything you said while you were rendering. Just so you know, um, it was all very scary. Right. Okay. Um, <laughs> this is with three lights in. It's just going through very flat. Quite yeah. Flat. Um, can you uh, select your Hemi light for me, please? Okay. Uh, let's jump over to your world settings real quick. And AO appears to be off, which is good. Uh, go uh, I'm about to blue screen, I think, so I'll be back in a bit. Okay, no problem. Oh, no, <laughs> it might be recovering. Okay, uh, so here's what I want you to do, uh, Chris. Over on your, take your fill light and deactivate its render ability. So click on the little camera. No, not your sunlight, that should be your, your key light, your uh, your hemisphere light. Uh, d d d d d Nope. Uh, click the camera. Okay. Not visibility. There you go. Oh, I don't. Want, right. I don't want the renderer to see it. Now, give me another render real quick. Actually, I tell you what. Press. Uh, okay, that's fine. Try to press. No, no, you're you're fine. Go ahead and just render it. You're good. Okay, uh, go ahead and do the same with all of your other lights. So was that anything that catch that turn off all the other lights, was that? I'm sorry? Mm -hmm. What did you say, Oh, Sarah? turn off all... Uh, caught half of Yeah, click there. on uh, your little camera icon for all of your lights, so the sunlight and the backlight. Let's just kill those off and do one more render. Right. So this tells me that your problem has got to lie in those materials. Mm -hmm. Because ideally, those would uh, not be responding at all. We just have black. Uh, so let's see here. Um. 
Well, I'll tell you what, let's just um, roll with it for now. If you need to create a temporary object, um, create one, and then we will uh, follow, the, follow up on this after class is over. Is that cool? Yes. Yeah, okay, because, yeah, something has been done to your materials that is causing it to uh, completely ignore lighting, but it's not a lighting issue. Right now it's a material issue. Hmm. All right. Okay. Yeah. I'll just create words. Yeah, just yeah. maybe slap a, a yeah, slap a sphere in or something, and uh, and you, you should be good to go. Cool. All right. Okay, so we're back, and we've got all three of our lights set up, and at this point, we would be done lighting. So we're just doing a basic three-point lighting setup with a sunlight as our key light, a hemi light as our fill light, and then a spotlight as our backlight. So are there any questions on this process at this point? And I'm not seeing any pop in. So what we're going to do is take a look now at the process of rendering. Now, this is actually a really simple thing, but it's definitely some stuff you want to keep track of because you can cause your render times to go crazy uh, with this if you're not careful. First off, one thing I want to point out, for the purposes of our render in the class, I'm not going to be using ambient occlusion, environment lighting, or indirect lighting. If you want to use these, by all means do so. They're pretty easy. Uh, the only thing I will point out to you uh, that will affect your overall look is if you turn on ambient occlusion, which, remember, you already baked that into the texture of your character, so you could argue whether or not you really need it, and the answer is you really don't. But uh, it's going to work in two different ways. If you set this to add... Ambient occlusion will brighten your scene up a little bit. You'll see, you'll feel some more light coming in. Things will just feel brighter. And it generally will look pretty good. If you set this to multiply, all you're going to get is the shadows. You're not going to get that brightening effect. And then finally, you can tweak your factor to control how much influence that ambient occlusion is going to have. But again, I just want to stress, because we baked it into the texture, we don't really need it. How about zooming in so I can get a screenshot? A screenshot of which? What do you want me to zoom into? There are several things I could zoom into right now. Uh, the main 3D editor. Um, zoom into what exactly? <laughs> Is there some specific object you want me to zoom into? Because, I mean, I can just zoom in. Here, check this out. We can just keep right on zooming. I can just go. Okay, so... Fantastic. All right. Uh, also, at uh, once you've got all of your lights set up and all this stuff is in your way and looking really irritating, I like to go into my 3D view settings and turn on only render. It just makes me happy. You don't have to do that, but it's just one of those things that I think looks kind of nice because it hides out all those lights and all that other stuff that you don't necessarily need to see. And we'll go ahead and look through the camera and zoom in about like so. Okay, so now our render settings are going to be very straightforward. Click on your little camera icon in the properties view. That's going to be your render settings. We're not going to be messing with render layers at all. I don't really care what resolution you render out for your own stuff. However, if you are submitting something to me, here's what I want. If you want to make a big version, please uh, do that on your own. I want... A resolution of 640 by 360, which is the same as doing 720p, but setting it to uh, to 50%, or I believe it's 50%. Technically, it'd be a quarter, but uh, if you just set this to 640 by 360, everything's fine. Your start and end frames, I just want to see your whole animation, and everybody's is going to be probably a little bit different. Mine goes up to 370. Uh, you Yours may go anywhere, so just make sure that your uh, frame range encompasses your entire animation. It's easy to overlook that step and then end up having to go back and do some more renders. Also, keep your frame step in mind. Leave that at one. Don't set that to two or you're rendering every other frame. Another big one, frame rate. By default, Blender's going to want to set this to 24 frames per second, which is film. But you want to set this to 30. So make sure that's set to 30 for the render. Now, here's where things get fun. 
I'm not going to stress too much about anti-aliasing settings for a video this simple. If you need things to look sharper, of course, you can change the number of samples if you need to, but really the defaults will give you everything you need, so we're not going to play too much with that. Your output is the next place I want you to look. So if you go under the output section, pick a location to put your frames that make sense in some place that you can find. I keep a little folder just off my C drive called temp, and that's where I stick everything. But you can put yours wherever you like. Just make sure you remember where it goes. I recommend for a job this simple, you output to PNGs, but you don't have to. Targa is a, another big time standard for video. Uh, it's lossless and very nice. It's just PNGs are very lightweight, and I'm not necessarily going to be a real quality Nazi on something like this. So we'll go ahead and leave that at PNG. At this point, you are ready to render. Now, somebody may be asking, and I, I guess I should keep an eye on. And it says, hey, Zach, damn, the frame rate's going to mess up my animation. Can I also go with 24, at least 25? No, you can go to 24. If you animated at 24, by all means, go to 24. When I was setting up the bounces, which is the only thing I really walked you through in terms of animation, I uh, gave him one second bounces of you know 30 frames each. So I was already animating to 30. Um, I was pretty sure I mentioned that. If I didn't mention that, then that's okay. Uh, just set it to what makes sense for your video, by all means. No worries. Okay, so uh, now moving on from here. Uh, now, somebody might be wondering, why don't we go ahead and just render out to a movie? Uh, and in our case, guys, we're going to be rendering out to H.264. Please keep that in mind. Uh, that's the, the same standard that uh, YouTube uses, and it, it creates very nice little tiny videos that are easy to ship around. Now... I generally just like to warn people who are just getting into rendering out 3D animations about this. Don't ever, 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 ever render out straight to a video file. Reason being is if your computer crashes while you're rendering out to a video file, you can have all kinds of nightmares. Um, basically, you you lose your your work and you have to start all over again. If you're rendering out to frames, individual pictures, and your computer crashes, no big deal. Just pick up on the picture you left off on and continue. So definitely, uh, the first time you render something, keep everything to some image format. And yes, I realize that YouTube is moving on to new formats and all that. Uh, but H.264 is a nice standard. That is what I'm asking you guys to send your videos in as, is H.264. And I'll mention that again once we get to the uh, final assignment and homework. Now at this point, all you really need to do is come up here to the top and click on the animation button. That renders out the active scene. I'm not going to do that right now, obviously, because uh, you know even if I'm getting... 10 seconds of frame, that's, well, 370 times that out. You, we have a long time to sit here. Which is why I have uh, already given everybody the ability to download some frames if you want to play with them. But first, I want to talk about something. Something that's kind of Blender-specific and pretty cool. Let's see, do I have another blank area I can work on? And that is the world of compositing. Compositing is a pretty nifty thing in Blender because you can do it either before or after the render. Basically, at this point in the game, once you have your animated scene, and so what I'm actually drawing here, or what I'm trying to draw real quick, is the Blender interface. So it's got, you know, stuff, lines, things. We've got our character. we got our timeline. You're ready to render. And you have two paths before you. Path A, you can just create a render and then composite. And in our case, folks, in case you're curious, uh, we're going to keep compositing very simple, just down to color adjustment. So if you need to uh, make your image a little brighter, make your video a little more vivid, tweak your colors a little bit, that's all we're really going to be handling, just because this is kind of an introductory sort of thing. Now, your other option is to actually handle compositing as part of the render process. <clears throat> Thank you. 
either one of these is fine. They'll both take about the same amount of time. It's just a question of when you want to do this. It's basically, do you want to treat Blender like a standalone compositor, or do you want to handle all of your color correction in your, as you create your final output? We're going to kind of do both. So here's how this is going to work. <clears throat> Let me jump back over to Blender. And let's see here. There's some, th some things we don't really need to see anymore. Uh, let me just look through the camera up here. That'll be fine. This great big view, we're just going to turn into a node editor. Now, you may not have known this, but in your node editor at the very bottom, you can switch this over to compositing nodes. Now, once you switch that over, for, of course, nothing's going to actually work at first. Make sure you check Use Nodes. And immediately, you get something. You get render layers feeding out to a composite node. Now, here's the deal. You can only have one final composite per Blender scene. If you need to sample, you guys remember when we were setting up uh, materials, how we had the ability to uh, grab that little viewer and sample anywhere along our network. It's very, very useful. If you need to do that, you can hit Shift A, and under Output, you have a viewer. You can insert that wherever you want and see what your composite looks like at any point along the way. Now, the real question is, what can you do in between these two nodes? We got a lot of power. You can hit Shift A and start just exploring things. Mostly what we're going to be focusing on is just this color area, and that's it. So what I'd like to do first is just create a basic render. So just click the button, and that's uh, right on the, the actual render node. It gives you a render button. And the great thing about doing that, it just gives you something to work off of. So at least click that once so you have something that you can see. Next, let's hit Shift A. And let's go under Color. And just for the fun of it, just to kind of get things started, let's go under Invert. And then because I don't want to have to unhook and hook in wires, notice that you can just drag over a wire. And when you see it turn orange, it'll automatically get inserted, which is pretty handy, actually. And if I just switch on RGB, you'll notice that we are inverting all of our colors. Now check this out. If I click Render again, watch what happens. We get a, a regular render, and I don't know if you guys can understand me when I speak right now. We, it was a two-stage process. We got our regular render, and then boom, the compositing uh, took over. Now we don't have to actually do another render. I just wanted to point out the fact that the render takes place and then the compositing happens right afterward. What we can do instead is we can just split this and let's press F11 and we can just leave this guy actually on a UV image editor at all times. And now whenever we make updates, like if I just delete out this node and reconnect my image straight over to the image, we'll always see our result up here in the image editor, which is pretty cool. Now, this does not allow for real-time feedback. Remember that I said that. Make a mental note. Uh, because you can load a frame stack in here and do the same thing I'm doing. Instead of using the render layers node, we can instead, and I'm just showing you this, hit Shift-A for input, bring in an image, Go to open, and let's see, if I go under my temp file, I've got all those frames I put up for download for you guys. I can load that in, set the source to image sequence, and I can plug that into the composite instead. You just need to make sure you set your frames up. So if I take my frames, make sure I set that to 370, like so. That is kind of handy, too, because you can determine exactly which frames you want to follow. The catch, though, is as I hit Alt-A, you'll notice I am not getting real-time feedback. Ignore what you see up here in the 3D view. What's happening in the 3D view is entirely separate from what's happening over here in the compositor, because right now, the compositor is not listening to the 3D view at all. It just so happens everything kind of lines up. The compositor is listening to a stack of frames that I brought in. Now, let's see. Um, how do you pick up where you left off on the render, meaning not having to start over? Well, think about it for just a moment. If you're rendering out a bunch of individual frames, all you're doing is taking pictures on a frame-by-frame -frame basis. Let's say your computer crashes at frame 240. 
Well, what I would do is take my start frame, set that to 240, always redo the frame where your computer crashed, leave your end frame alone, and render again. It'll just pick up and continue. Okay, so let me get rid of this image node. We're not actually doing that right now. We're doing kind of like a pre-compositing. We're handling all of our color correction on the front end before we do the render itself. So let's hit Shift A. Let's bring in a color node. And one of my favorite nodes for color correction is actually RGB curves. This is true in Photoshop as well. I love curves, and it scares the living hell out of some people, and I totally understand that. Uh, but curves are actually pretty easy once you see what's going on, once you know the idea of a curve. You've got to take a look at this graph first off. Though uh, Blender doesn't, by default, show you a nice, clean, happy histogram inside your curve editor, which I kind of wish it would, but you have to think the left side of your graph represents all of the darks in your scene. The right side of your graph represents all of the lights in your, in your scene. So uh, all of your dark values on the left, all of your light values on the right, and everything kind of gradates as you go from the left to the right. By default, you have a linear relationship. You have a straight line. You can reshape this curve, however. So, if I take my curve and start to swoop it down, take a look at what this relationship says. That says, take your darks, which we're mapping in both directions. Right? We have darks here, going to lights, and vertically we have the same thing. We have darks up to lights. By taking our curve and swooping it down, we're taking those dark areas and basically expanding their reach. We're saying areas that should have been light a moment ago, we're going to make you darker. Here's, a, here's one that'll kind of rattle your head around. I don't, let me see if Blender will let me do this. Some apps don't really like it when you do this. Yeah, I'm trying to do an invert, and it's kind of griping at me. Oh, there, there's close to an invert. And all we're doing here is we're taking our dark values and pushing them up to light and taking our light values and pulling them down to dark. And of course that inverts things. So we'll leave this at our default little uh, linear relationship right now, which is exactly what we have. But if you needed to brighten your image a little bit, all you need to do is grab your curve and say, maybe take your midtones, which are going to be halfway along that curve, push them up to brighten them, or pull them down to darken them. And if you keep it in your head that simple, you'll find that playing with curves is very, very easy. Is it possible to set a composite preview as a background in the node editor? I think I saw that. Uh, I haven't done it. Um, so I'm just, I'll be dead honest with you. I'm not saying it can't be done, but I've never actually done it that way. I generally split things off uh, like so, and it keeps things um, nice and neat for me so that I don't feel distracted. And uh, Gav is not a panelist anymore because he crashed. Let me fix that real quick so Gav can occasionally say things when he needs to, because he's our TA, and that's what we have him for. Uh, how do you delete just one of those little dots in the curve editor? Uh, well, if you click on it, and let's see, uh, if you hit the little X button here, delete points, so you just select the point you want and click your little X, and that'll make that go away. Now, that... The, the C here, this is kind of like for gamma, right? This is basically taking the entire brightness of your scene and pulling it up and down. Now, you can also do this on a color-by-color -color basis. So let's say, for instance, you want to warm things up a little bit. Well, you can take your reds, grab your midtones, again, about halfway down the curve, and maybe push those up a little bit. You notice that everything's starting to turn just a little bit red. Now, here's something that, uh, well, it, it will help you out. Sometimes you want the ability to compare so what you can do is, well, there's a couple of things. One, we go to Output and drop in a viewer and connect this. Actually, I'm sorry, let's not connect that there. Let's connect this all the way back to our original. And that's one way we can kind of uh, compare the results against each other. But even this is, and when you're doing subtle stuff, it's hard to tell. So what I like to do is bring in a split viewer. Check this out. This is actually really cool. If we move stuff around, we could say maybe take our render layers and plug this to the first image, take our RGB curves, plug this into the second image. And now you get a nice little preview where you can swipe over and you can see the original 
and you can see what you're doing to it. And you can make that horizontal or vertical. So when you crash while rendering, will it save all the renders somewhere, or will you need to recover? The renders, uh, as you put it, are just pictures. They are going into your output folder, which is why I said make sure you put this in a place where you can find it. Uh, for instance, just to show you, uh, let me navigate over to that location on my computer. This is mine. So it's just a folder, and each time a frame gets rendered, it writes a little image file into this folder. So you haven't really lost anything. You could print them out and make a flip book. You could print them out and make a flip book. It'd probably take a whole lot of toner and a whole lot of patience. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's see. Now let's get out of here. Now, really, at this point, uh, it's really kind of up to you guys how far you want to push things. Now, for our animation, I mean, I kind of like the idea, you know, Take our mid-tones, maybe warm them up just a little bit, make the, the day look a little warmer. Uh, but you don't have to. Like, you could take your blues and push them up a little bit and start to cool things. Remember, you can mix colors. So if we took, you know, for instance, if we push up our reds and we push up our blues, you know, you start to get a little bit of purple in there. But definitely, you know, play with that a little bit. Now, uh, some other things you can add as well that uh, may help you out. Things like uh, brightness contrast. These are just like their Photoshop equivalents to for you Photoshop people. Uh, hue, saturation, and value is very nice as well. Uh, but let's grab something like a brightness contrast just for a quick example. And we can just take that, run it over to our composite. Remember, the composite node is what's going to actually be fed into your final render. So make sure that he's getting the final result that you actually want to see at all times. And then here we can just take our brightness and kick it up, adjust our contrast as well. Now I'm doing something really gross. I'm just showing you that this does work. When you're done, when you're happy, the great thing is now all you have to do is just a render, just a regular animation render, because you're taking your render layers, feeding them through this network, and then saving those out through the composite. That means when you now do a regular animation render, just like we did a moment ago, your final frames will already be composited. They'll already have that color correction on them. Which is amazing, by the way, and it's great that you can do that. And let's see, um, a couple of questions are rolling in, so I'm going to try to catch back up. Um, is this all for fine finish work, uh, rendering one by one rather than straight to an MPEG, uh, so you can change parts of your animation that might be substandard? Well, think about it. Uh, it's just a good habit to get into. As you get more uh, into complex animations, there may come a time when you have to maybe adjust one little thing that takes place at a certain time. Doing that in, out of a single MPEG file is more or less impossible. You'd have to do an entire re-render. Uh, say your art director comes in and says, hey, that character who walks in at this frame, I need to see him in blue but you've already got a thousand frames that took place before him. You don't want to render all thousand of those other frames. So uh, definitely always, always, always render to frames first, then make it into a movie. It'll, it'll save you so much time, hassle, pain, strife. Uh, and, and also it's nicer to your computer because if anything happens, if your computer just shuts down halfway through rendering out a film, well, you're in a lot of trouble. Okay, so uh, can you watch it like a movie in Blender, all your rendered pictures? No, Blender doesn't have real-time feedback like that at this time. Uh, I imagine that's something they're trying to work in. And if they have added it since I read up on it, I haven't seen it. I haven't found any way to turn on behavior that is uh, real-time playback for frames. <laughs> Let's see, uh, is there a way to do a very rough render that is quick and inexpensive just to check the timing before uh, doing a polish render? Absolutely. Uh, check this out. Up under render, do an OpenGL render animation. What this is going to do is render what you see in the viewport. Now, I'm not actually going to click this, but uh, this will just, it's just kind of like hitting Alt-A and playing your viewport, but capturing it and turning it into frames. Very, very handy uh, feature. Uh, I really don't know much about this color correction, haven't studied color theory. Will there be a class on this stuff? Not right this second. Uh, the idea, I'm just kind of showing you how compositing works, and it really was something that you'll, you're going to run into a lot as you do 3D renders. You often won't get 
the colors that you want. Now on a project this basic, uh, there's probably not much of a cause to be all that picky. But you may look at it and be like, yeah, and I, I kind of wish the, the whole scene felt a little warmer, or maybe it's too dark. Uh, in a lot of 3D renders, uh, sometimes you'll just feel that the colors aren't as vivid as they could be. And you'll want to just kind of take the colors and make them pop just a little more than they did before, which is where this compositing stuff really, really makes your life a lot easier. Now, once you are finished, once you have things looking kind of like the way you want them to, again, all you got to do is click render out your animation, and you're going to end up with a whole bunch of individual frames. Are there any questions up to this point? Any, any other questions? Uh, will the OpenGL render animation allow you to save frames as pictures? Uh, that, it, that should be slave to whatever your output settings happen to be, though I suppose I could test it. Uh, let's see. Think. I may have to hit escape and bail out of this. And if we open up my test folder, there you go. There's all the PNGs popping in, and you can see how quickly they're being created. Now, I'm going to bail out of that by spamming the escape key. But that's all there is to it. All right, so let's see here. Uh, let's jump out of here. There's My render result is black right now, but that's okay. Okay, at this point, uh, I've, barring any other questions, let's... Um, we're almost done. As much as I would like to take a break, we are so close to being finished... But what I'm going to do is pause the video, and I want you guys to tell me if you're actually ready to move on, or if you need a minute, or if you have any other questions. All right, so at this point, you would have a whole bunch of frames, which I do. And let me go ahead and open that up and kind of pull it up here, and I'll get out of the test folder. So I have all these different PNGs, and your next question is probably going to be, well, how do I turn those into a movie? Well, that's very, very easy to do inside of Blender. To keep things nice and clean, though, I recommend you do this. Save your scene, and just go to File, New. And I'll just go ahead and delete out that plane. So I get a completely blank scene with nothing in it. And I'm going to adjust my interface a bit. We'll have a 2D view on top or an image editor, excuse me, and a node editor directly beneath that, which will switch to compositing, turn on use nodes, and there we go. Now, I'm not going to get too much into the whole video editing thing, for those of you who are curious about that. Not in this project. We only have this one scene. So, take your render layers node and just delete it. We're not inputting from render layers. <laughs> For everybody who's like, oh, you know, we got to have something to teach you a little later. Come on. So, now hit Shift A, bring in an input, and this time, instead of render layers, bring in an image. We will open up that location with all of our frames in it. Make sure you set your source to image sequence and adjust your frames accordingly. That's going to be really important. Now at this point, all of your color correction is probably done. Uh, now you wouldn't, it doesn't have to be. You could have just done a straight out render and not bothered with any of those color correction nodes, at which point you could do your color correction now. There's nothing stopping you. So you can just take your image, plug it straight out to your composite, and then, let's see, if we just jump over here, uh, say render result. So if we tell our 2D editor to follow the render result, now we can actually scrub through and see... Ah. Uh, hang on, why isn't that playing? Do you need auto-refresh? I think I do. Um, Source? Source, image sequence, that should all be good. Hmm. <laughs> like it always played every time before. Yeah. Oh, my start frame is killing me. 
Oh, start frame is 370. Nyert. Oh. I reversed the two numbers. Thanks. Feel free to laugh at me. Ah. Ah. Now you can scrub through and play back. That's what happens. So there you go. Now, no, you can't just hit Alt A and watch that play back, but you can scrub through and get a really nice representation. But the idea is really at this point, hopefully you've already got everything all kind of squared away uh, the way it needs to be. And it looks like my render result is pretty tiny. Make sure that if you need to, you adjust your render size accordingly. Now, in this case, really all I'm worried about is getting this turned into a movie. So what I'm going to do is go over to my render settings. And this is the easy part. Just take your output and set it to whatever your format's going to be, in this case, H.264. Please send me an H.264 video, I beg you. And since, you're already, since you've already got it cooked out into frames, this will be a really, really fast thing. Your, um, does the size matter? In no, this? not at all. The, I mean, the render, oh, the, on, in the... This guy? Yeah. Yeah, I would go ahead and set that back up. So in this case, I believe I was doing 640 by 360. And we'll go ahead and set that to 100%. And, oh, these might be at a different size because I did these way, way, way earlier. But that's okay. I'm not going to, I'm not going to stress that right now. Let's just see what happens. Um, let me jump over to my little thing, right click, propertize, I don't remember, because I made these a little while back. Yeah, these are actually 1280 by 720 I did full-size renders on these. No wonder they took so long. <laughs> there, now everything fits. So just make sure that your resolution fits and matches. Uh, but if you've been following along with my instructions, that will already happen. It's just on my end. I sent you guys some nice big frames to play with for some reason. All right, now I'm going to make a new folder. So notice in my output, I've got my temp folder. We'll just call this final and then put a little backslash in front of it. That means it'll be a new folder. And we can name this now too. We could call this my movie. Not, not with an exclamation point. Uh, set this over to H264. Scroll up to the top and just render the animation. And look how fast that is. Now, I do have probably only one little issue here, and that is that um, my end frame is 250, so I'm just going to get the first 250 frames. Let me go ahead and hit escape. Cancel that out. Make sure this goes all the way to 370 like it needs to. Then render out my animation. Now, I don't even need to render it. This is kind of like a cooking show. Um, but, see, I've got... Notice the name of the actual file is 1 to 250, so it knew that the end frame was 250. And I should have something to show, but it's just the first couple of frames because I escaped out of it. What about your frames per second? Does that matter? Indeed it does. So definitely set that to the appropriate FPS for your final video. Somebody had mentioned earlier they wanted theirs to be at 24, so please make sure you set yours at 24 if you need to. Uh, can you please tell me where you got your sky texture from? I joined too late and didn't find anything on the forums. Yeah, sure. You can grab the sky texture from the streaming support files that are available over in the member sponsor lounge on 3D Buzz. It looks like I have another PM. Um, so go to your streaming video support files, it's in the stickies, and jump in here. And under Blender, there's the frames I'm playing with right now, and there's the sky texture. You can just download it right there. And let's see, can you make a movie in Photoshop same as GIMP? Uh, technically, you should be able to, yeah. I don't know why you would. There's so many better pieces of software for that sort of thing, but, I mean, you know, I guess using the tools you have. So, uh, at this point, you have everything you need to be able to just render out your animation and have a final movie. Are there any other questions? Just kind of wait for some to roll in. So, without any questions, because I actually did pause the video for just a second to see if everything uh, was copacetic, let me jump over to Photoshop, and let's do just a really kind of a quick overview slash review of the process, okay? So, you have your animation done. And I don't know why my brush does that sometimes. I guess I need to push harder. 
whatever. I'm just make it work. Uh, let me see here. If I hit tab and kill off pressure sensitivity, there we go. That's so much nicer. So uh, let's see. First off, your animation's done. You should be ready to render. Do, do all your lighting. You can either A, do what I'm just calling pre-compositing. Which basically means composite prior to render. Or you can composite after. Now, technically, we're not even really doing true, you know, quotes according to Hoyle compositing. We're just doing uh, some color correction, and that's all. But same idea. Then finally, take your final frames. Use the compositor and turn those into a movie. I don't know why I thought suddenly have the urge to draw a movie frame here. But at this point, you should be happy, because now you can take a break. So, that's it. That's our entire, uh, our entire procedure, and really, that's everything I wanted to show today in class. So, let's get on to your assignment. It's pretty straightforward. Make a movie! That's the big thing. I want to see your final video. It needs to have all of your lighting. And I'm, I realize in most cases it's going to be fairly subtle. So I'm just going to take your word for it. I'm just making it part of your assignment. Make sure you do some adjustment to your colors through compositing. Well, assuming they didn't composite the uh, images they sent us for the previous homework, we will have some... Yeah, we actually, we'll, ha we'll have a reference, um, and it'll probably be really subtle, but, I mean, that'll change a lot, too, because um, only at this point will they have their official lighting in place, and that changes everything. Uh, so I'm just making sure that I say that I am wanting you guys to get in there and add in some color adjustment nodes so that you can see how they work. It's just going to help you. I'm not asking you to, you know, crank your reds up through the roof just so it looks like Mars and I can tell you did something. I just want you to get in there and get used to how those work. I won't be able to tell probably when I look at your assignments, and I know that. This is something that I'm throwing in for your edification. And somebody just said, so, about uploading. Uploading should be no big deal. Dropbox, it's becoming more important by the day. Or whatever your, your favorite uh, media server type thing. Uh, some people use, what is it, Mediafire, I think? I hate Mediafire, because they spam you with ads when you try to download the stuff. But uh, I highly, highly, highly recommend you grab a Dropbox account... And if you're going to be doing any of the future classes, you will need a Dropbox. Yes, we're making it a requirement, so uh, you need to get on the ball with that uh, sooner or later. If you want, um, I can send you an invite to Dropbox. It'll give you an extra quarter of a gig worth of space if you accept my invite. And I get an extra quarter of a gig worth of space, too, which is pretty handy for me. So, um, and say, so, oh, wow, they've increased to 500 megs when you get more users. You can now get 16 gigs now. Well, it probably doesn't help me at all because I've already got so many at a quarter gig. So um, anyway, so please, if you need to, just use Dropbox. It should make it very easy to send your file. An H.264 file will be pretty small anyway, and they do RAR down uh, and get a little bit smaller. So uh, anyway... That's it. I'm not seeing any other questions, so I am looking at going ahead and thanking you guys and moving on for the rest of the day. Now, here's one last thing. Earlier in the syllabus, I had mentioned that this last uh, assignment was going to be two weeks. That was way early on, when we first started this out. Uh, however, 
that's not actually going to be the case. I'm just giving you guys one week to get this knocked out. Originally, I had planned to make you guys all do your own animations after this class. But just kind of based on some of the feedback I'm seeing here, I don't think that would be wise. I think that would just lead to a lot of undue stress on everybody's parts. So I just want you to take the uh, the, the video that you've been working on, the, the animation you've done up to this point, and give me a nice, clean render of that. But you've got all week to tweak things out. If you need to do any final adjustments to particles, to animation, to lighting, if you need to clean up textures, you've got all week to do that. Because this rendering process is actually pretty fast at the end of the day even on a slow computer, uh, and just get it out, out the door. If you have a slow computer, use fewer grass particles. I'll understand. Um, just turn it down to something that will uh, give you time to render. But one more thing I will mention Start early. Please do not yeah. procrastinate. I'm begging you on hands and knees right now. Please do not procrastinate and think that you can be like, oh, well, the, the deadline is about, you know, an hour and a half away. No big deal. I'll start my render now. Everything will be just fine. Because it, yes, there'll be no moving the deadline on this it, one. If I get a because it's the end of the yeah, course. If I get a lot of uh, of assignments at the very last minute that all have like virtually no grass, I'm gonna know what's going on, folks. So please, I beg you, start early on this. Get your lighting taken care of as soon as you can, and get that render started. Okay, folks, that's it. So. um I wanted to thank everybody for attending these classes. I want to thank you all for making this first Blender class a wild success. It's been amazing. And uh, really, with that, I think I'm going to go ahead and sign off, and I will see all of you around 3D Buzz. I do hope to see you all in the uh, 102 class, which will be coming up soon in the next few weeks, and that's going to be a character modeling class, uh, making use of the new uh, B-Mesh system inside of Blender. So definitely some uh, some cool stuff on the way, and of course I'm still around 3D Buzz. It's not like this you know this is like a real major ending for anybody. Uh, please, by all means, if if you're having any problems or if you're curious about anything, feel free to shoot me a PM, ask me questions about whatever you might need, and I'll help you out in any way I possibly can. So thank you all very much, and I will catch you all in a future class from 3D Buzz. Take care. <laughs>